will start ma'am yes yes yeah so good morning everyone on on behalf of the three organizing colleges vasantrao naik government institute of arts and social sciences nagpur rajkumar keval ramani kanya mahavidyalay jaripatka nagpur and jm patel arts commerce and science college bhandara i welcome you all to this seventh day of the online classes of third semester ma english uh, be, of ma english for the syllabus prescribed by rashtra sant tukroji maharaj nagpur university nagpur friends we are starting with uh, the paper english comedies which is the third optional paper uh, and uh, the first unit of the, in the first unit of the paper we have uh, a drama of shakespeare much ado about nothing uh, we have uh, dr jyoti patil madam principal and the head of the department at renuka college uh, besa nagpur uh, as a resource person for this uh, ma'am is presently principal and head of the department renuka college as i have already told you uh, her educational credentials include uh, after completing her ma uh, masters in english ma'am has done her llb dte and uh, the topic of her phd was uh, jumpa lehri and along with that ma'am has uh, uh, is a recipient of honorary delete by inox international university with more than 30 years of teaching experience her areas of interest are indian english fiction indian women writings indian diaspora and technology in english teaching she has created various publication and uh, that includes 10 literary books the list uh, the long book, long list of books she has to her credit and uh, as many she has as many as 27 books with scor- scholarly chapters she has chapters in 27 books uh, along with that uh, ma'am is a recipient of best teacher award uh, of 2009 and the best paper presenter at six international conferences that include uh, english literature international conference 2015 at jaipur harso uh, international conference on religion literature and culture in 2017 at pune uh, ma'am has also present ma'am, ma'am has presented more than 75 papers at national and international conferences and uh, she is a poet and has more than 50 poems uh, has recited more than 50 poems uh, in uh, uh, the national or international poetry festivals Uh, ma'am has always been a source of inspiration uh, for us and uh, on behalf of uh, the organizing colleges i uh, welcome ma'am to this session and hand over the mic to her for her presentation over to you ma'am thank you thank you dr kapil uh, for initiating such such a herculean task and a very challenging task so let me first congratulate you and uh, all the collaborating colleges and their heads and their coordinators those who have come up with such a nice thing because in pandemic students are really very much in the dark they are grouping around they are searching for the material and it's not available so it's good that you have started this initiative and you have and i also express my gratitude to you for including me in this task okay so not taking much of the times of the students welcome my dear students uh, i am really happy to be a part of this and uh, i hope uh, my screen is visible yeah ma'am it is visible visible okay yeah. so okay so welcome friends and a very pleasant and happy good morning to all of you you must be fresh and sitting Uh, of course concentrating on the on the presentations and up till now you have made various presentations now the task at hand today is different william shakespeare william shakespeare was a fantastic playwright whose plays are still relevant today his much ado about nothing is a play that sends a strong message about female power and the power of conversation to its readers through the actions of various characters So let's learn why this is so important for this play set during the Renaissance. As Professor Professor Dowden classified Shakespeare's literary career into four periods: in the workshop, in the world, 
out of depths on the heights. We know this. In the workshop, he was experimenting and learning. In the world, his command of language meter and characterization develops. Out of depths, uh, he reaches the summit of his literary powers. The four great tragedies are written in this period. And on the heights, he reaches to the heights of peace and tranquility. And if I say in Robert Browning's word, what he ch chanted in Pipa Passes, God is in heaven and all is right with the world. And the plays written during this time were dramatic romances, Symboline, The Tempest, and The Winter's Tale. But we see the skillful handling of comedy during his second period, that is, in the world. And he himself says this, that actually encapsulate the complete com Shakespearean comedy in his own words, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, the spurns, the patient merit of the unworthy, unworthy takes, so meaning, after all, we would put up all with all life's humiliations, the abuse from the superiors, the insults of arrogant men, the pangs of unrecreated love, the inefficiency of the legal system, the rudeness of people in office, and the mistreatment good people have to take from bad. So when you could simply take out your knife and call it quits, actually, this is actually Hamlet's soliloquy for summing up his co comedy, but let's begin now. This is MA part two's portion as Sir has already mentioned, third semester and the paper's name is 3T3D. I don't know what is that, uh, that stands for English comedies. And under English comedies, you have four units. I'm going to deal with unit number one. And the topics here covered, first of all, background, the beginning of English comedies, domestic drama and courtly drama, the Renaissance elements, the importance of fools and importance of heroines in Shakespearean comedies. And text for detailed study is Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. And my presentation will be in four parts, wherein I'll focus on English comedies, Shakespearean comedy, Much Ado About Nothing as Shakespearean comedy, and Much Ado About Nothing in detailed study. So let's begin. Yeah. And you know, drama uh, from the earliest times, drama has been divided broad, broadly into two kinds, tragedy and comedy. The one dealing with the dark side of life, the other with its light side. Tragedy aims at inspiring us with pity and awe and comedy aims at evoking our laughter. In tragedy, the characters are involved in circumstances that impale them towards an unhappy fate. But in comedy, though fortune may be unkind for a while, all comes right in the end. So let's begin with English drama. Drama, actually drama as a form of literature has always responded to the social needs and the change, changing social structure of the particular nation to which it belongs. Though in Middle English, uh, Middle English society comprise people with firm belief in the concept of sin and repentance and the Christian values of life. It was at the same time, a society of entrepreneurs seeking trivial opportunities of liberation from the strict theological rigidities, explores new areas. So let's see what are those new areas. Yes, before going further, I'll talk a little about, little bit about Geoffrey Chaucer. A mirror image of this diversity manifested in the English society in the medieval ages is perhaps best illustrated in a prologue to Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, written in the form of tales narrated by a group of pilgrims. You know, there were 20, 29 pilgrims who narrated four stories each. Why I'm telling these details? Because in, sometimes in late exam, these silly questions come. So coming from multiple social contexts who are traveling together to the shrine of St. Thomas A. Beckett. Through the prologue, Chaucer subtly draws the, uh, the outline of the multiple motives which draw these people to undertake a pilgrimage together. What motives? Motives which are anything but religious. So religious 
teachings are gradually taking the back seat and new things are coming up. Let's see, the development of comedy in English drama can be traced back to the medieval English society as it came under the classical and Italian influences with the passage of time. Whenever I talk about classical or Italian influences, take it for Renaissance. Okay, so that is Renaissance time. It evolved as a complete form in itself, thereby it is through the blending of the native popular traditions and the classical influences from the other literatures that English comedy gradually acquired the ability to cater to a more sophisticated audience and entertain the audience across various classes alike through the upcoming English drama. When drama was moved out of the control of the church, it was taken up as a form of entertainment carrying out by the emerging trade guilds. The very first instances of comic interventions in English drama can be traced back to the miracle mystery plays. Among the four cycles of miracle plays, Chester, York, Wakefield, and Coventry, two such significant innovations may be seen. One in the play called the deluge in the Chester cycle, and the second is actually Seconda Pastorum in Wakefield cycle. In the deluge, the comic intervention in the biblical story of Noah is brought through the character of Noah's wife, who appears as an ill-tempered, aggressive woman. She refuses to enter the ship without the gossips of her own uh, about the town. And finally, when forced, she slaps her husband. So it's probable folly of human nature and behavioral pattern, which is used here to induce comedy. The tendency to deviate from theological boundaries is in the similar manner manifested through certain characters who exhibit traits or follies discernible in common people, as reflected in Secunda Pastorum, which portrays the contemporary society through a dialogue between two shepherds. While that's why they, it is called Shepherd's Play. While it is finally in the second Shepherd's Play of the Wakefield cycle that this comic element acquires a distinct form in the character of Mark and his wife, Guile, who carry out the entire episode of stealing a lamb representing the native pastor. So let's move. As English drama moved from miracles to the morality plays, the comic gradually came to be manifested in the ludicrous behavior of the vices. Based upon the consequent tussle between the good and evil sources to acquire control over the soul of man, the morality plays at a later stage exhibited signs of the comic in the form of characters representing the voices who gradually transformed from the manifestation of only evil in the to the incorporation of characters such as mischief. So abstract qualities come as characters and they play some comic roles representing comic traits. The example of morality plays, keep it in mind, very popular, every man. It, here I have written Robin Hood and every man. Okay, and you also know that uh, what morality play, plays teaches you right and wrong. Allegory of Satan and God is changed, replaced by uh, vices and the abstract qualities. Okay, so these things were there. Now, how, however, the comic elements in English drama became more prominent with the evolution of the interludes, addressing directly the social and political context of medieval England. The interludes provided a scope to contextualize the comic elements with respect to the contemporary society, much more than its precedent, which portrayed an abstraction of the journey of a human individual through life. So it is a step ahead in comic elements. And the best example here, the perfect example of this can be seen in the play called The Four Peas by John Haywood which pro proceeds in the form of a dialogue between uh, a palmer, a partner, a apothecary, and a peddler. Two were churchmen, okay, partner and palmer. One is a me medieval pharma pharmacist, apothecary, and the last was peddler, peddler you know, a commoner, okay? And they indulge in telling of lies related to their respective traits. 
it would be interesting to note that all the characters in this play relate to the contemporary society and the content of the play now came to concentrate upon the element of humor involved in the art of everyday life. The first independent English comedy thus evolved in the university houses such as Cambridge and Oxford and then reached to the common people on stage. Rolf Reister Duster by Nicholas Udal, which is acclaimed to be the first English comedy, was staged in 1553-54, having moved away from the allegorical representation of life on stage. The center character, Royster Doister, is involved in funny episodes, who is a version of the swaggering soldier of Marlis Glorious by Plotus, remodeled to suit the native expectations. The second English comedy was Gammer Gurton's Nudde. Under the influence of Latin, both Whenever I talk about influence of Latin, take it as Renaissance. Both the plot and the characters were now conceptualized to meet the demands of comedy as a genre. So comedy begins as a different genre. In contrast, domestic drama deals with family problems of middle A, middle and lower class, though not yet emphasizing the ordinary lives, the development of dramatic works is slowly working towards more realistic plot lines. And one of the essential elements in domestic drama, Renaissance theaters, Renaissance theater marks the arrival of the pastoral drama, referring to the relationships of the rustics, rustics villagers. Though this describes the events of ordinary people, the, sh the shows tended to stretch realism, market realism focused mainly on the romantic relationships of the rustics and were decorated with an emphasis on the comic aspects of theater. So this pastoral drama, as we have seen in the Shepherd's play, was considered to be more successful than the traditional comedies and tragedies enforcing the further development into domestic drama. Actually, domestic drama is not actually in the field of comedy quite often, but Domestic tragedy, you know, and whenever we talk about domestic tragedy, uh, that Henrik Ibsen's name come up, who is known for his de domestic tragedies, his famous uh, uh, plays where a doll's house and ghost, a woman killed with kindness, Yorkshire tragedy, and witch of Ende Montons. But it, that is not my field here. We are today go. I am talking about comedy, and even Othello for, uh, as classified as domestic tragedy, which is written by Shakespeare, you know. Let us talk about Renaissance elements in Shakespearean comedy. The actual development of comedy as a form, as influenced by the classical writers like Plotters and Terence, began to be reflected in English drama in the hands of the Renaissance humanists around the mid 16th century. As learning in the English society now emphasized upon the knowledge of Latin and the classics. Knowledge of Latin and the classics? Renaissance. Latin was considered the basis of erudition. From the simplicity of farcical portraitures to the intervention of the native elements and the vernacular, suggests the close proximity with which the drama of a nation reflects the growth of the society. William Shakespeare wrote and acted in his plays during the Renaissance. And Renaissance was the time from 1300 until 1600, that means 14th century to 17th century. But before that, uh, Latin, uh, in Latin literature, it came in uh, 12th and 13th century, then French literature, and then it, it came from 14th century to English literature, when ideas of society changed. During the Renaissance, a new concept started to form that changed society, which was humanism. Humanism. There is no denying the order brought to bear at the end of most Renaissance comedies. Criticism has also emphasized the happy ending of comedy and the movement from order through disorder to order again. Shakespeare was one of the first playwrights to bring the Renaissance core values to the theater. Shakespeare embraced the Renaissance 
by becoming simply simplistic first of all and he also followed two dimensional writing style of pre renaissance drama he focused on creating human characters with psychological complexity and incorporating incorporating new ideas about religion politics and science and there is also willingness to learn and explore more and the whole concept of rebirth of naturalism secularism and individualism was focused okay through his works let's talk about shakespearean comedies his comedies are mostly written in prose and with specks of blank verse shakespeare's 37 plays can be conveniently divided into five groups you know it in your ba you have studied these comedies tragedies tragic comedies or dramatic romances histories and roman plays and i can further divide he is comedies are further divided or classified as purely romantic comedies i have enlisted the first five the two gentlemen of verona love's labor's lost a midsummer night's dream as you like it and twelfth night next is serious comedies in that list i have included four much ado about nothing our uh detail study matter today uh, all is well that ends well the merchant of venice and mesopotamia and the third category is the realistic or farcical comedies where i have enlisted to the taming of shrew of the shrew and merry wives of windsor so in in all shakespeare has written down 16 comedies i have included only the important ones and sometimes it is called that he has written 39 plays but the two last two plays he has written in collaboration uh, and they are not completely written by him prince of tyre and the two noble kinsmen so let us move now characteristics of shakespearean comedy uh, let's see the major characteristics of shakespearean comedies here women dominated plot the fem feminine roles are more important than the masculine love themes leading to marriage that is the main theme of shakespearean comedy often more than one pair is ultimately joined in wedlock each having worked out its destiny in a plot of its own one pair is always superior to the other and it is with them that the play is primarily concerned the next is prevailing atmosphere of mirth and merry naturally in tragedy it will be gloom and sullen but in comedy the prevailing note is that is that of mirth and laughter jest and jol youthful jollity though sometimes the story takes a more serious turn the lovers must suffer you know if it's a love story most of the comedies are love stories so the lovers must suffer and for this shakespeare has said the course of true love never did run smooth but the end is invariably happy okay difficult times will come but ultimately everything will be solved next is music songs and musical instrument even i will include dance music is the essential feature of the world of shakespearean comedy as it was earlier in the works of john lady there is a court music of duke uh, of duke orsino uh, if music is the food of love play on the traditional music of the clown played on pipe and tabor popular snatches and songs like those of sir toby sir andrew in twelfth night of amiens in as you like it of balthazar in much ado about nothing no i am not going to talk about balthazar later balthazar is an attendant of don pedro he was a musician and a singer and he used to play the lute and the last one is the clown last but not the least the clown or fool several of shakespeare's comedies introduce a fool or clown fool is partly drawn from life partly from literature he is a direct development of vice vices of the moralities and he is also theatrical version of the professional court fool or jester so don't you remember that akbar used to have one one of his friends birbal so that is court jester okay what are now let's see what are the dramatic elements of shakespearean comedies how shakespeare what implements or uh, elements he use to create this comedy the drama in comedy so they are mistaken identities or misconceptions uh, reasons versus emotions emotion will will of course work more 
fate and fantastical atmosphere of fantasy, idyllic settings, that is pastoral scenes, and separation and reconciliation with the happy ending. And you know what is happy ending. They say, now hereafter, they started living happily ever after. So when you live happily ever after, when you you come to, uh, come closer, okay, come together, that naturally in the form of, form of marriages in Shakespearean comedies. Yeah, when we talk about Shakespearean fools, this line is very famous: "Better a witty fool than a foolish wit." Shakespeare not only borrowed from this multi-talented jester tradition, but contributed significantly to its rethinking, like Shakespeare's. Other characters, the fool begins to speak outside of the narrow confines of exemplary morality. Shakespearean fools are usually clever peasants or commoners that use their wits to outdo people of higher social standing. In this sense, they are very similar to the real fools and jesters of the time, okay, but their, their characteristics are greatly heightened for theatrical effect. So naturally, fools and jester of real fools or jester, when we say, we remember Akbar's Birbal and even the Tenali, Tenali Rama, for that matter. I have given a list of the fools here <clears throat> in his plays. A fool in Timon of Athens, Autolycus in Winter's Tale, Clown in Callow, Clown in Titus Andronicus, Costard in Love's Labor's Lost, Dogberry in Much Ado About Nothing. So we are going to study in detail about him. Dromeo, there were two Dromeos actually in Comedy of Errors, False Stop in Henry IV, Part One and Part Two. Feste, Feste is actually one of the Shakespeare's most multifaceted clowns. Okay, Grumio in Taming of the Shrew, Lance in Two Gentlemen of Verona, Lancelot Gobo, The Merchant of Venice, Lavas in uh, All Well, All Is Well That Ends Well, Nick Bottom and Pook uh, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Pompey in Messer. Formazer, Speed in Two Gentlemen of Verona, Fool in King Lear, and ultimately Touchstone and As You Like It. So Touchstone is really, again, an important fool from Shakespearean comedies. Throughout his plays, two distinct types of fools are portrayed. So the fools are of two categories. Those they were wise and intelligent, fools are wise, and those they were natural fools. Natural fools means idiots that were there for light entertainment. You can see some of Shakespeare's wise fools in Touchstone from As You Like It and Feste from Twelfth Night and Lancelot in The Merchant of Venice. Whereas some of his natural fools include Lance from Two Gentlemen of Verona, Bottom from Miss Summer Night's Dream, and yes, our Dogberry from Much Ado About Nothing. As Shakespeare's fools speak truth to the other characters, they also speak the truth to the audience. So it's very important to know about the fools. Importance of Shakespearean fools in comedies. Isaac Asimo is right when he says that it's, of course, is the great secret of the successful fool. When the fool is successful, when he is no fool at all. So don't take fool as a fool. He may be witty. Okay, the clown or fool is often a great asset to the play. It is said of Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth's clown, the famous tarlatan, that he told her more than of her faults than most of her chaplains and cured her melancholy better than all her physicians. That similar function is assigned to the fool in Shakespearean plays, in comedies in particular. He provokes laughter by his wit, as Touchstone does in As You Like It, and he sings sad and sprightly songs as Feste does in Twelfth Night. He is distinguished by his motley costume, but we are not motley in his brain. Okay, so he, he can have a funny, funny costume, but he's not funny, okay, when he talks. Indeed, he sometimes shows more learning and good sense than most of or some of the leading characters. Yeah. Let us talk about Shakespearean heroines in comedies. Before talking about Shakespearean heroines, let us first have a glimpse of the social condition of the time. Social and political power was entirely in the hands of men in Elizabethan England. Both women and men in the lower classes were powerless. Okay, But women in the upper classes, 
were in particularly volatile position as their value was generally reckoned to be a rich or powerful man's path to more riches or more power. Daughters were considered to be possessions and were passed on from father to husband to forge alliances between the rich and the powerful. But one of the most interesting things in Shakespearean comedy is his presentation of strong women. Uh, in fact, the heroine is often superior to the hero as in, as you like it, Twelfth Night and several other comedies. This does not happen in tragedy, you know, uh, which is especially a play with a single hero with a name title also, Othello, Hamlet, Richard II, okay, and several others. You have never heard of Rosalind, Viola, or Portia, okay, the names of the heroine for the title of Shakespearean plays. Rosalind, uh, before I talk about Rosalind, Shakespeare actually is able to present some women uh, in a way that, that allow them to take to be taken seriously because uh, using the Elevation, Elizabethan theater uh, convention and the convention was women disguising themselves as men. men. And you see in May, most of the Shakespearean plays, women used to disguise themselves as men because the actors were originally men. <clears throat> women were not, not actually during that time, were permitted to act on the stage and the young men used to play the female part. Rosalind is the central character in the play of uh, As You Like It, and she's disguised herself as a man throughout until the end and is able to organize everyone to fit in with her needs and desires. But Beatrice in Man, Man, much ado about nothing, is a fiesta, independent woman. She does not even have to disguise herself as man because of her reputation in the family who shouldn't be tangled with. And she is highly intelligent and would be regarded as a feminist in our time. Viola in Twelfth Night, finding herself shipwrecked, having lost her twin brother in the rape. Why Viola's first instinct is not to appear to, for help, but to disguise herself as a man and finds a job as a servant in the household of the Duke. So all these are promising ladies. Further, we find a striking resemblance. One curious fact about uh, particularly four plays, uh, The Merchant of Venice, Twelfth Night, as you like it, and much ado about nothing. As in all these plays, there are two female characters associated together, as are Portia and Nerissa in The Merchant of Venice, Olivia and Viola in Twelfth Night, Rosalind and Celia in As You Like It, and Hero and Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. So, I, I kept on talking about much about nothing. Now let's enter into this arena. Much ado about nothing means to make fuss. Now you tell me what do you mean by much about ado about nothing? Okay, tilka tar banana, or you can say yeah. Any any other uh, phrase you know to make fuss? Okay, about nothing, making mount making mountain out of mole hills. Okay, so let's see what is there. Much Ado About Nothing is one of Shakespeare's finest and best loved comedies, written in 1598-99. There are many themes running through this comedy, including love, confusion, and the theme of nothing itself. Nothing is there in the title. In this story of crossed wires, hidden identities, feelings, honor and deceit, we are also presented with the themes of friendship, and marriage. It is about misunderstandings, love and deception with the battle of wits between Beatrice and Benedict and the plot involving young lovers, Claudio and Hero. The play touches upon jealousy, trust and the importance of separating illusion from reality. So these are uh, some, uh, some uh, prominent themes. But if you try to encapsulate everything in, in one or two lines that is there, where things are not quite as they seem, people are misled or misheard, or I should say misnoted, and this leads to comedy and drama. So noting is again, much about about nothing, can be much ado about noting also can be done. 
So let's see how it goes. Uh, it is uh, Shakespeare's uh, classic, one, best one of the Shakespeare's classical comedies and is a classic comedy and is in fact the most performed of his plays, even more than Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet. While it was also popular in Shakespeare's time, its themes are still very contemporary. Much Ado About Nothing is a story of mixed up love, lies and deceit. Themes that are still prevalent in current hit movies like To All the Boys I Have Loved Before and 10 Things I Hate About You. Okay, and it's not enough. The 2001 Hindi film Dil Chahta Hai is a loose adaptation of the play. So again, you watch the film through the, through the binocular of this Much Ado About Nothing. And then again, 2014, one YouTube web series entitled Nothing Much To Do is a modern retailing of this play. The play was very popular in its early decades and it continues to be one of Shakespeare's most performed plays. Yes, let's have a look to dramatist personal. There are a number of characters in the play. You have major characters, minor characters, okay, including lovers. Now I have, I, I took many names here even uh, during the course of the say, two stages, two parts, Beatrice and Benedict, Hero and Claudio, as well as Don Pedro, Don John, and also Leonardo. Uh, Leonardo I have not included here, An elderly, he is the only one elderly person here in this play. All the actors are quite young. So I'll talk them one by one, okay? Beatrice, orphaned and unwed niece of Leonardo, a strong will, quick-witted, snipping at and challenging Benedict, not afraid of taking men on, in jesting or in anger, considered by Don Pedro and Leonardo to be a cheerful of cheerful temperament and good friend to her cousin Hero, Leonardo's daughter. Beatrice is bold and fiery. She already had an unfortunate relationship with Benedict. Beatrice comments about courtship. Now you will understand her character when what she says and how she says that. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear, swear he loves me. And she also says this in act two, scene one, he that hath a beard, is more than a youth. And he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me. And he that is less than a man, I am not for him. So see her wittiness here is reflected through this, these lines. Benedict, a gentleman and a soldier, close friend of Claude, uh, Count Claudio, quick-witted and can be relied upon to entertain his colleagues committed to being a bachelor. He wanted to be a bachelor, okay? A little bit vain and arrogant about his attractiveness to women, maybe hiding his deeper feelings for Beatrice, a fair man who likes to see justice done, not a romantic at heart, but a realist, appears more experienced in the ways of the world than Claudio. And what he says will tell you Okay, when I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Again, he is witty. Perhaps he is matching to the wit in, as far as wit is concerned with Beatrice. Now, Claudio, a count from Florence, often portrayed as a tall, dark, handsome young man. Claudio actually is count from Florence who travels to Messina. Messina is actually the setting the place in Sicily, okay? So the whole uh, play is acted in Messina uh, with Don Pedro, the Prince of Aragon. So they traveled to Messina, Don Pedro, Claudio, and Benedict, three, these three young men. After a while, I'll tell you when I I'll tell you the story. It becomes clear throughout the play that Claudio is unconfident, impulsive, and passionate. He is Don Pedro's right-hand man and falls in love with hero when he sees her at Leonardo's house. He is very naive and finds it difficult to defend himself when Benedict criticizes him for intending to marry. And see how does Claudio describe hero here? After Don Pedro confirms that hero is indeed the only heir of Leonardo. I looked upon her with a soldier's eye, 
that liked but had a rough, rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. This reveals that Claudio's motive was money, not love. Hero. Okay, the name is Hero. She's not hero or heroine, I should say. Hero is the daughter of Leonardo, a governor in Messina, a governor of Sicily, who is living in Messina, where these three young, young people, okay, young boys visited. And cousin to Beatrice. Hero was cousin to Beatrice. Hero is the innocent and obedient daughter of Leonardo. She contrasts with the more outspoken and independent Beatrice and presents a conventional image of a suitable and desirable wife, meek and docile kind of girl. Claudio describes her as a jewel when he first meets her and praises her for being modest. Hero is sweet-tempered and demure. What she says about Beatrice reveals her own character. So what she says about Beatrice, watch it, as Beatrice is, cannot be commendable. No, but who, who dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air. Oh, she would laugh me out of myself, press me to death with wit. So she was scared, but Beatrice was quite confident and promising. You see, like many of his comedies, Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing involves young couples getting together or trying to get together and ends with the happy lovers getting married. On the surface, this appears to be a really rather fairy tale, fantastic like uh, ending. Okay, but both uh, say, but both sets of lovers in this play, Claudio and with Hero and Beatrice with Benedict, seem to end the play in a happy relationship. Okay, but but there are some difficult times. The banter between Beatrice and Benedict is amusing and ridiculous. And the ensuing drama between Hero and Claudio is probably not far from the modern drama in the relationships of your friends or even yours. Throughout the play, images of war frequently symbolize verbal arguments and confrontations. At the beginning of the play, Leonardo relates to the other characters that there is a merry war between Beatrice and Benedict. The play is peppered with metaphors involving the taming of the wild, of wild animals, represent, represents the social taming that must occur for both, for both wild souls to be ready to submit themselves to the shackles of love and marriage. So in the opening act, Claudio and Don Pedro tease Benedict about his aversion to marriage because Benedict initially was reluctant to marry, okay? And comparing him to a wild animal, Don Pedro quotes uh, in the common adage that in time of the, in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke, okay? He says, and meaning is that in time, even the savage Benedict will surrender to the taming of love and marriage. And since Don uh, John here is the <coughs> villain in this play, but Shakespeare doesn't call him villain, okay? Uh, I will talk a little less about him and Dogberry, okay, will have my full focus in the coming time, okay? In the coming slide, I will be talking about him, Dogberry. Uh, as is usual in Shakespearean comedy and Renaissance comedy generally, Dogberry is a figure of comic incompetence and a, a compulsory part of it, a product of his pretentiousness as he attempts to use sophisticated terminology with disastrous results. Example, you can see he, he, he says he is very pineapple of politeness. There is something wrong. He is very Pinnacle of politeness, he wanted to say, but he used pineapple. Uh, Dogberry is described by Nettle Encyclopedia as a self-satisfied night constable with an inflated view of his own importance as the leader of a group of comically bumbling police watchmen. The humor of Dogberry's character is his frequent use of malapropism. Now, we'll, you will ask, what is malapropism? Malapropism happens uh, when a word is replaced by an incorrect, incorrect word that sounds similar but creates a kind of fun or comedy, okay? And uh, there are many, many examples of it. Uh, if you remember, I'll 
रिकॉल वन एन टीवी सीरियल भाभी जी घर पर हैं दैट भाभी जी ऑलवेज यूज टू यूज द रॉन्ग वर्ड इंग्लिश वर्ड इन दैट प्लेस दैट्स अ काइंड ऑफ माला प्रोफिजम नाउ After this, you will not call it malapropism, but you will call it dogberryism. Dogberry says, "Okay, you are thought here to be the most senseless and fit man for the constable of the watch." So, senseless is not a correct word here. It should be sensible. Okay. For instance, when Dogberry accuses the conspirator Burakio, and he says, "Oh, villain!" Okay. Thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this. Redemption is again the wrong word. It should be condemnation. Okay. So uh, he means to say, say something like condemnation and wanting to tell Burakio that he will be punished by by God for his villainy. But he uses redemption. That means meaning rescue or recovery, having comic effect. Okay, to create the comedy. But these confused and comic turns. of phrase used to such a great effect by dogberry in the 50s uh, it was known to the renasa crowds as dogberryism and this dogberryism when it is in 1500 uh, called dogberryism this attitude of using wrong words after this this word malapropism actually the earliest variant was malaprop it comes from the character of mrs malaprop in uh, in a play of uh, r r b sheridan's play the rivals in 1775 so nearly 200 years okay later it was called malapropism people have forgotten about dogberryism so let's call it dogberryism because it was the earlier earlier people don't know this kind of use of words how it can be used and how any name is given to it okay so malapropism is nothing but it is dogberryism only in the play dogberry is the chief of the citizen police in messina and he is first seen instructing his constable on duty on their duties he tells them that it is perfectly fine to sleep on duty and that if they see a thief they should not touch him okay to avoid becoming defiled by association with crime or you can say otherwise you will get infected by corona so don't touch the thief okay during their watch the constable overhears a conversation between two characters brachio and conrad so i haven't talked about these two characters two characters they are minor characters okay one of whom has been part of don john's plot to discredit hero this i am going to tell you in the latest slides they misunderstand the conversation and arrest the two on the spot for the acts of treason and what acts of treason because they they call the prince princess brother prince prince here don pedro okay his brother don john a villain so we, they caught these two people because they were calling don john a villain and they could not understand the other things but gradually uh, when uh, things are actually been examined uh, that the truth came to the fore and they are brought before the governor leonardo who is at the loss to understand dogberry's nonsensical description of the supposed crimes because he he was using the same kind of dogberryism and it was really difficult to understand him but allows dogberry to examine them okay now we will talk about the story and themes and since i have already talked about the characters you have little bit of uh, idea about the story and theme story in gist and outline if i say Benedict, Claudio, Don Pedro, these three young men arrived at Leonardo's house in Messina. Beatrice and Benedict bicker with each other, and Claudio falls in love with Leonardo's daughter, Hero. Okay, Benedict and Beatrice don't love each other, but later on they do. This I will also tell you how they started loving each other. Claudio and Hero like each other, but then uh, they don't. Okay, in between something happened. This also I'll tell you, but then. they do again and ultimately they they actually got married and everyone gets married ultimately yeah now let us begin in detail and let's see what happened in act 1 don pedro the young fellow the out of these three young fellows one is don pedro okay prince of aragon he has defeated his evil brother don john don john 
the villain okay in battle but has allowed him to live and has pardoned him okay you defeated him then you pardoned him and allowed him to live with him only and however don john is jealous of his brother and his friends and seeks to cause trouble and naturally there should be a trouble so he was the troublesome factor the play opens with and the play opens with don pedro become, being welcomed to messina by leonardo leonardo the governor of uh, sicily okay so he welcome because to celebrate that war because they have won and after winning they have come winning his brother he came to leonardo's place claudio a young friend of don pedro takes a shine to a beautiful young woman and claudio when he happened to see a beautiful young girl there leonardo's daughter immediately falls in love okay don pedro who's hero for claudio this is another twist in the play that even claudio is not going and asking or talking to hero but don pedro his friend okay go who's hero for claudio and claudio and hero ultimately they arrange to be married uh, don john of course sets about trying to drive a division between the happy couple okay while claudio and hero are finding love another side claudio's friend benedict and hero's cousin beatrice they are engaged in battle of wits insulting each other in public and trying to give the impression that they cannot stand each other so when they were talking about love the other couple was just fighting okay fight of words okay leonardo now in act 2 there are plans some plans and plots also leonardo holds a mass ball again this is a very peculiar most of in most of the comedies even in merchant of venice you can see there is there is a masquerader wearing a mask you have a kind of a function your party just like we used to throw parties okay so leonardo holds a mask ball to celebrate the end of the war and while at the ball the engagement of claudio and hero is arranged okay at the mask ball Don Pedro, Claudio, and Hero therefore decide to trick Beatrice and Benedict into falling for each other. So they decide that they should love each other rather than fighting. Okay. And after a series of overheard conversation, Benedict and Beatrice realize that they really do love one another. Okay. And uh, in Act Three, Scene Two, Hero says uh, when they were planning to uh, change their minds. Okay. if it prove just a minute if it proves if it 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 proves okay so that loving or love goes by hips okay some cupid kills with arrow and some with traps so if loving is there by happening okay the so cupid kills means cupid arrow will kill or you will be killed by cupid arrow or sometimes you we have to set some traps so this kind of a trap they set for beatrice and benedict to fall in love okay now act 3 don john's plot now let us understand what what is there there was two plans okay uh, to make beatrice and Beat, uh, benedict to come together okay another plot is don john's plot at the same time don pedro's brother don john seeks a way to spoil the general happiness don john plots with the soldiers those soldiers boracchio and conrad which we have already seen okay when we are talking about dogberry to deceive claudio into believing hero has cheated on him okay so they they tried that claudio should start uh, uh, actually distrusting or doubting hero he makes his henchman boracchio to woo hero's gentle women and what was the plot that his henchman that boracchio will go there okay and hero's gentle women margaret okay she will wear hero's uh, get up okay on hero's balcony she will be there and uh, with margaret this this person who rakin will meet and made up to look like hero this uh, lady margaret and they they will come a little closer okay and this will be shown uh, to claudio by don john so don john then make sure that claudio witnesses this so the young lover is convinced that his wife to be is unfaithful okay now at the wedding claudio is still deceived into thinking uh, in the fourth act okay hero has cheated on him and he denounces her and leaves her apparently dead from shock okay with the help of the priest leonardo and beatrice and benedict 
they decide to uh, pretend that hero is actually dead and until her name is cleared on the other hand so this happened he said you are adulteress okay you are not fit for uh, um, to marry with me and i denounce you i denounce i i am giving you back to your father uh, this marriage is cancelled okay but on the other hand benedict having been gulled because these people were trying that they should fall in love so uh, he was gulled by his friends and into thinking beatrice beatrice secretly loves him declares his love for her and she reciprocates and she also accepts because she was also been gulled by the friends and she come to know that secretly benedict loves loves her but she tells him when when they got engaged okay they they decided to marry she tells him to prove his love it's not that immediately she accepted him prove his love challenging claudio for what he has done to her cousin hero because claudio has done a wrong to hero so challenge him for a duel meanwhile boracchio's big mouth gets him into trouble so meanwhile this this silly fellow fellows boracchio and conrad okay they started they they get drunk then and they started talking we did that we did that and that run everything was so nicely done and that villain has done all those things the local constable of the night watch our very much dogberry whose speech is marked by the comical malapropism i told you over here him boasting about don john's scheme and arrest him actually he over hears that he is calling don john a, a, a villain okay so he says well, how he is he is calling uh, prince's brother a villain okay and here is and later on things came out that they actually acted upon a plot and uh, they wanted to uh, actually implicate hero and uh, dogberry reveals boracchio's association with don john and their guilt and just after benedict Uh, has challenged claudio to a duel but before that benedict has already challenged claudio for uh, for a duel okay so that they can they can have a fight one to one fight now act 5 the resolution of the discard so ultimately all these entangled things okay will be disentangled as penas for causing uh, for causing hero's death claudio agrees to accept leonotto's niece in her place the niece turns out to be hero okay so what happened because they declared hero is dead okay there and uh, they made claudio to accept that leonardo has one daughter uh, niece okay so they he can get married to the niece but ultimately when uh, things come it uh, comes to actually terms uh, it came out that it was none other than hero only the play comes to a joyful conclusion as the lovers are reunited Benedict and Beatrice Beatrice announced that they will share the wedding day okay so you know in all shakespearean plays there are one not only one wedding but many weddings are actually performed but don john has been captured while trying to escape and is left for future trial while the play ends with a merry dance and there is a dance also so it's it's not over my dear i i'm going to talk a little bit about the themes okay because you have to answer some questions despite never having met her before the start of the play claudio has an immediate attraction towards hero when he is alone with his friend uh, benedict claudio tells him that in my eyes she is the sweetest lady that i i ever looked on it would seem that this attraction claudio has for leonardo's daughter is purely the result of first physical beauty and second the desire to marry a noble and rich and virtuous women while claudio cannot be faulted for desiring such a qualities in a wife it is telling that he is all he is ready to marry her after only the first meeting and that he goes to leonardo not hero herself to propose marriage so at, at first somebody some uh, uh, pedro actually who's on behalf of uh, claudio okay and now here leonardo he went to leonardo to ask for her hand hero's hand he didn't go to hero this is again a uh, something the proposal of marriage immediately he he went to leonardo in place of going to hero Th these are certain things which show that his love was not real now his lack of trust also you see you should never doubt you should have a faith and faith is very important trust is very important lack of trust always destroy your relationship so shakespeare's this message is relevant really and contemporary 
okay so this lack of trust is praised upon preyed upon don uh, don john again later in the play with much harsher results when don john convinces him that hero has been having an affair with boracchio which he want he want created okay again claudio makes no attempt to investigate means believing somebody else okay uh, the situation further once uh, he is shown the false scene in the window and uh, he immediately makes plans to humiliate hero at the at their wedding that was really wrong this event is also important because one of the most attractive features of hero to claudio was her virtuousness and that was uh, spoiled in uh, in his eyes without an emotional attachment to hero claudio has no reason to trust her and thus she is easily made into an adulteress in his eyes so this this is really a situation which in the modern times we can face we can face so we have to be very careful about decisions and in this essay deception in much ado about nothing richard finch writes as claudio falls in love with hero's beautiful face but not with her feelings while don pedro arranges a profitable marriage okay convention is excessively restrictive and sincere human feelings is deficient so no human feelings or attachment you can say they have now let us talk little bit of themes and motifs of course i am perhaps exceeding the time but please pardon pardon me for that on the surface much ado about nothing is light hearted comedy but there are darker themes of dishonor death and deceit running beneath beneath the humor apart from other themes of love appearance and reality and of course nothing or noting much do about nothing explores the themes of love so we'll talk about the themes of love love is a is a beautiful and yet frustratingly unavoidable part of life and shakespeare shows us the many ways in which people can react to this and manipulate this for their own desires this play uses comedy to reassure us that mistakes and misunderstandings in love are an innate part of humanity as we struggle to communicate how we feel towards another person as you will see it is very much a play about appearance and reality deception and truth these are the kinds of questions that humanity will always face when dealing with love that's why don pedro says speak low if you speak love okay the lines are there looking at the play in this way we can say that in much ado about nothing shakespeare makes the point that true love is achieved with understanding trust commit and commitment examining the relationships of the contrasting sets of lover the shallow relationship of hero and claudio and the deeper relationship of beatrice and benedict though they hate they used to fight but they have that they were real okay shakespeare does this by effectively conveying the dramatic technique reversal how shakespeare dramatizes the concepts of human misunderstanding deception and dichotomy through effective dramatic techniques the purpose of the technique is to show the reader the complexities of human nature by demonstrating that even a common example of misunderstanding could change the direction of one's life and the perception of an object and this is evident through the quote okay that he says i love love her i feel but later on he says they are not to take her back again okay so some people create their own storm and then get mad when it rains okay and okay i'm coming to clo uh, closer to the end of my presentation but before that let's see what about noting this is also important because they may come as questions to you it is in fact very much to do with noting this is an intended pun of or uh, nothing nothing i'm not going to tell you what what this mean nothing means you know void or not okay or half seeing with perceiving dimly or not at all noting you means you see half see or you perceive something or you don't perceive anything noting also referred to overhearing or noting something what you call eaves dropping something down and obviously this is of significance to shakespeare's plays in several ways first don john's malevolent pl plot hinges on claudio being made to overhear or witness hero 
really Margaret. Okay, flirting with another man. Okay, second, Don Pedro, Claudio, and Hero, they were planning to convince Beatrice and Benedict together. Okay, turns on the two of them being made to over here. Okay, over here again noted. Okay, the third uh, and the three friend talking about how the one secretly loves the other. And Benedict over here is his friend talking about how much Beatrice admires him and vice versa. And Be Beatrice also listens the, or hears that his friends are talking how Benedict loves. And third, Baracchio is noted or overheard bragging about his part in bringing to fruition Don John's plot. And that actually made all the mistake. Okay, that was the, the turning point, you can say. And Dogberry subsequent noting and his noting is very important because that turns everything right, okay? And clearing up the mystery. And now come to the conclusion. Uh, it is really most uh, Shakespeare's most straightforward comedies in which the plot is simple, but the fun is to be had in the skirmishes of wit between the B couple, okay? Who are far more interesting than the play's nominal hero. No pun intended here, nominal hero and the heroine. And it is hardly surprising that for many readers and hater goers, its official alternative title should be the, Be the Beatrice and Benedict Show. And in Much It About Nothing, Shakespeare gives his opinion on the issue of true love versus sudden romance. And he weighs in favor of true love. And you tell me, you will, you will uh, vote for true love, not for sudden romance. And there is a link also, you can go through the full text and enjoy the full text or watch the play or you enact the play yourself, okay? And present it online if you can. So that is a kind of a learning, real learning will take place here with that. Though it is a concluding slide and I, I want to say you thank you. But before that, let me just tell you about my own uh, ideas. This actually the obvious lesson here, Shakespeare's plays are not didactic. They don't teach you any lesson, but still there are some lessons. The obvious lessons here is not to jump to conclusions, not to overreact to simple inconveniences. However, personally, I think that every one of William Shakespeare's plays teaches our most subtle lesson. You cannot simply fall in love at the drop of a hat and making assumptions can cause more trouble than it is worth. So these lessons are promoted in the entirety of this play. Love yourself and in that love, not unconsidered, leave your honor, what William Shakespeare says. So with that, that's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I conclude. Over to sir. Thank you, ma'am. Kapil, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am started with uh, uh, the history of English drama with the bifurcation of separation of comedy and tragedy. She went back to the prologue of Chaucer where the origin can be traced. Then the Shepherd play was mentioned and morality, miracles. And it is interlude that marks the beginning of comedies. That is what she told us. Then the first English comedy, Ralph Royster, Doyster, and the second, Gamer, Curtain's Needle. These were the initial comedies of English drama. And uh, uh, this is what... Uh, uh, transformed uh, to certain extent into a uh, domestic drama. Then uh, the Renaissance elements in the Shakespearean uh, uh, comedy were introduced and uh, the bifurcation of Shakespearean plays into uh, five different uh, under the heads that is comedy, tragedy, tragic comedy, romances and historical plays. From there uh, we come to comedies and comedies uh, two uh, are of three types. They are romantic, serious, and realistic. And after ma'am gave us the characteristics to the Shakespearean comedy, she introduced us to Shakespearean fools and uh, heroines, the important characters of Shakespearean comedies. And after this background, a sound uh, platform for you to understand and study the Shakespearean comedy, Madam introduced us to uh, the prescribed drama that is much ado about nothing. Then, uh, the different uh, adaptation, it's different adaptations into movies, serials. And uh, after that, she has introduced us to the characters, summarized the play act wise, and uh, finally uh, uh, finished off with the message of the play for all of you that don't fall at love at the drop of the hat. At the drop of the hat. So thanks a lot, ma'am. Uh, um, in spite of your busy schedule, ma'am, being, being, uh, 
principal at Renuka College, and along with that, uh, she is a member of many committees. Uh, but in spite of that, ma'am agreed uh, for this session. So on behalf behalf of the organizing organizing colleges, uh, I thank ma'am for uh, her uh, positive response and uh, hope the same kind same kind of support from ma'am in the coming online classes as well. So thanks a lot, ma'am, once again. And I thank you. Thank you. Over, and we'll be meeting in the evening at four o'clock at five o'clock. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Have a good day.